So it's uh, all for play for still? I think so. Do you want to bet against us? <laughs> Hi, Vince, and welcome to For the Love of Pomegranate podcast. I uh, just wanted to jump on today and get started with something that we're going to be doing an awful lot over the off season, which is discussing any transfer links, discussing any players that may be coming through, may be linked to us from certain teams, certain leagues, and uh, through certain outlets. And it was an interesting one that came up overnight last night. Philip Hellander, center half from Rangers, Swedish international. I thought it would just be something interesting and nice to kick off our transfer link um, segment within the actual podcast itself. So without further ado, let's take a look at Philip Hellander. As I mentioned, tall, rangy, center half, uh, Swedish, 27 years of age, playing with Rangers at the moment. Let's take a little further look at his biographical um, outlook. So as I mentioned, he was born on the 22nd of April, 1993, which means that he's 27, going on 28 very, very soon. Six foot three and a half. He's a left footed center half, which is pretty important i think in the greater scheme of things when we will look at him as to where he fits in with aston villa his potential fit should i say as we look forward um within this podcast itself so previous clubs that he has played for have been uh 2011 2015 he played with his hometown club of malmo uh, in sweden uh, 2015, 2016 he moved on to play with verona in the italian uh, in italy um nordic Players playing with Verona at some stage, moving to Aston Villa. Uh, one that springs to mind is Martin Larson. Maybe we could catch lightning in a bottle again like we did with Martin Larson. I don't know. I don't know. It's uh, it's just food for thought. Um, 2016 to 2019, he played his football with Bologna. And uh, from 2019 to present, he has, as I mentioned, played for Rangers under the tutelage of Steven Gerrard. Uh, some achievements that he has had within his career so far is in 2017, he became a full uh, Swedish international. He has won the Swedish top division on two occasions, 2013, 2014. And also this very year, he has won the Scottish Premiership in the year 2020, 2021. Arguably, his finest hour, especially at international level, came during the Under-21 Championships of 2015 when Sweden went all the way and actually won that championship. And that team itself was full with some very, very promising youngsters. And uh, it's it's interesting to see that, you know, what trajectory that they're, um, they've had very, very decent careers. Um, and maybe they're maybe 27, 28, maybe that's when they... they uh, go on to reach their full potential and as i mentioned philip helander is in and around that age bracket so uh where have these links come from so overnight the list originally came from sports bladet i think that's how you pronounce it my swedish isn't the best and i certainly am not going to try and announce the headline that it, we have in the bottom right hand corner but this was also picked up by the Daily Record, and it was also picked up by the Birmingham Mail as well. Some really, really good write-ups there if you guys want to check them out and see well, see any of those write-ups there. Uh, also, I found it on the bootroom.com um, online uh, webpage as well. Uh, so it's been reported in various different places. It's not the first time that we've been linked with Philip Lender. Um we can trace Villa's interest back as far as November 2017. When Tuto Mercato had an exclusive, I can read that part. It was an exclusive that um, Aston Villa were looking at, and they, they had sent scouts to watch Hellender to play in Serie A for Bologna. And um, it was also announced then in 2018 by HITC.com that Aston Villa were looking to renew their interest after scouting. They said there was more scouting missions were uh, were set up for Philip Hellander. And that was under the tutelage of Steve Bruce. And that was in September 2018. Also, it was reported that Aston Villa had sent scouts to see him twice uh, when playing for Sweden as well to, to check on his progress. So there are some historical links to looking at this player and to being interested in this player from Aston Villa. Now, I mentioned... Two dates there, 2017 and 2018. 
And a lot has happened in the club since then. There's been a lot of change. There's been a lot of overhaul, especially in recruitment, acquisition, and even at the team manager level. So what still remains from 2017, 2018? So since the original scouting trip in November 2017, Aston Villa sacked seven members of their recruitment and technical staff. Now, this also included Ian Atkins, who was the then head of European scouting. You would have to imagine that the original dossier and that the original uh, reporting on him would have been um, part of Ian Atkins' remit. Now, that is interesting because we still continue to go and to... um, We still continue to go and scout him again in October 2018. You know, under under uh, Steve Bruce, there was still some sort of interest, and Aston Villa had obviously seen something that they liked in him. But Steve Bruce, as we mentioned, left his role in, with the club in October 2018, and uh, you would have thought that that would have ended our interest in Philip Hellander. We've appointed Johan Langer and uh, and Rob McKenzie, both as a director of football and head of recruitment. They were appointed in August of last year, and you would have to look and think and see where. Uh, where the connections to Philip Lender may have come here. We don't know if we are actually interested in Philip Lender. That is important to state. But if we are, there are two connections that we have here. Obviously, making the very broad and vague connection between Johan Langer being a man of Nordic uh, uh, and, uh, and of Scandinavian um, extract and the fact that we have a Scandinavian footballer here as well, um, Swedish player, uh, you could make the, the connections there networks scouting obviously scoring that that area from a young age johan langer may be very very familiar with him as well rob mckenzie on the other hand where do we see do we see any links do we see any kind of connections between the two leicester have been um have been also rumored to be interested in philip lender and they've been rumored to be interested in him over a couple of years as well now as we know rob mckenzie was the director of recruitment. He was involved, heavily involved, the head of recruitment, should I say, for Leicester uh, for a period of time up until 2018, I'm almost certain. So maybe the scouting, maybe the interest had had come from then and maybe there may be some interest from Rob McKenzie from that era, era of time as well. So when we're looking at these links and we're looking at the probability of these links, it's important, I think, to see, is there any... Is, is this just agent talk? Is it paper talk? Where does it come from? Is there anything that we can extrapolate from previous uh, links, previous connections between people at the club and the actual player uh, himself? So there may be something we may be able to extrapolate from there as well. So just let's just take a look statistically. So what does Philip Lender bring to the team? Now, prior to looking at these, I do wish to give a little caveat. I am very heavily stats-based. I do love my stats. I do also understand that stats are numbers. and They do not take into account the strength of opposition or the strength of the league that they play at. So I do wish to say that at the very start here, that while I will be mentioning numbers and mentioning that Philip Lender is good or better than some players in the Aston Villa team with these numbers, I do obviously understand and fully, fully know the caveat that the strength of opposition brings when you look at a lender up against players playing in the Premier League. So now that that caveat is out of the way, let's take a look at how he for, how he performs um, you know, over the course of 90 minutes. So from a defensive positioning point of view, this seems to be a really key aspect of his game. Seems to be really good positionally, doesn't tend to panic, doesn't tend to dive in. We look at that when we're looking at, at, at his tackling stats in a moment. He does love to be in the right place at the right time. As I said, there is very proficient with blocking shots. So he blocks 2.6 shots per minute, per 90 minutes, should I say? 2.6 shots per minute would be absolutely fantastic. But 2.6 shots per 90 minutes, that actually puts him in the top 98 percentile so that, of all players, in the to- all defensive players in the top five leagues. I'm going to mention where players fit in or where this player fits in in the percentile within the top five leagues in Europe. The bigger number is better, the lower number is worse. Okay, so just to kind of get that out of the way first. So when Philip Lender is in the top 98% of, of defenders, that means he is he blocks more shots and he's better at blocking shots than players, than uh, other players um, within the top five leagues in Europe. Okay, he also has uh, a pressure rate of eight pressures per 90 minutes, and that uh, comes in in the upper echelons within the top third uh, percentile as well of pressures uh, over the the course of 90 minutes. So from the point of view from positioning uh, and getting in defenders faces or getting in uh, strikers faces, getting blocks in, he's very, very proficient. When we look at his pressing and his tackling, he doesn't get involved in, in, in the press as much, so he doesn't 
dive in. He doesn't, you know, he kind of lets the play come to him. And he's more likely to stand off and to use his football intelligence to cut down space. So he's not the quickest defender in the world. He doesn't dive into tackles, but he does get pressures on. He allows the play to come to him before he pressures the player. He's not a rush type player. He doesn't, he doesn't kind of run around like, like a headless chicken. Uh, he gets his blocks in when he needs to be. He lets the play come to him pretty measured and um, when we look at his at, at his tackle rate he doesn't dive in doesn't make that many tackles 0 0.8 tackles per 90 minutes puts him in the bottom five percent so uh, he doesn't make that that many tackles at all and um, from a passing point of view he's not very fleet of foot and he's not really blessed with taking the ball out of defense he's not going to dribble this ball out of defense and progressed on the ground as he's taking it forward himself he is decent at passing and he has a pass completion rate uh he, he or sorry the amount of passes completed within 90 minutes comes at 38.2 on average that is in the bottom 23 percent on doesn't isn't tasked with doing a lot of passing the ball out of um uh, out of defense and um, his pass attempts per 90 minutes is 43.6 that comes in in the eight, the bottom 18 percentile he's not playing in a team that's very ticky tacky he doesn't make an awful lot of passes just because he's in the lower percentile here doesn't mean it's a negative for him it just means that the team isn't really tasked with playing the ball out from the back their defenders don't get an awful lot of touches and therefore don't have an awful lot of passes amongst themselves between themselves and midfield. Um, but the big thing that we want to look at here is that his pass completion rate is 87.6%. means he's very, very uh, judicious in possession, doesn't give the ball away. And a really interesting stat is he's more predicated to making that medium-length pass, which is a pass, any pass between 50, 15 yards and 30 yards. So that's what a medium-length pass is, is, is classed within um, fbref.com. Whereas, which is a great statistical website, and um, that's he, where his his passes. He makes most of his passes there, and he makes twenty two point eight uh, of those types of passes on average per ninety minutes. And that's an interesting stat to remember as well. So, from a rating point of view, he's better than average in the air when you look at him playing. I've looked at a couple of clips of him this morning, and um, he's better than his statistics uh, show. And this is once again speaking about statistical analysis. It doesn't tell the whole picture. Um, he is in the bottom third of all heading metrics, but then again, not an awful lot of like he's not tasked with going up to win the headers uh, either in, uh, in in the Rangers uh, in the Rangers defense. He's really really seems to be that kind of real assured defender who he's more of a stopper than he is uh, um, than he is a ball playing center half, and he's not one of these big dogs that goes up. He can win headers. He's got a good jump in him. He seems pretty athletic from that point of view. It's just he doesn't make an awful lot. He doesn't doesn't have an awful lot of aerial jewels. When we look at it there, his aerial jewels of 2.2 per 90 minutes, that comes in at the in 35th percentile. So it just doesn't have an awful lot of aerial jewels. So therefore, he's going to win less jewels per game. And he do, he's going to lose less jewels per game. You know, he loses 1.8 over 90 minutes and, and, and his percentage of aerial, of aerial jewels won. Only does come in at 55%. That's probably a bit more concerning. The fact that, yes, he isn't making as many headed clearances um, as other defenders in the top five leagues in Europe. But the fact that he's still only winning 55% of those is a bit concerning when we look at what our other um, uh, our, our other center halves are, are doing. So let's take a look at where he, he stacks up against our, uh, our own center halves. Now, I mentioned as well that he's a left-footed center half, and that's why I've picked Tyrone Mings and Courtney House, who would be our two um, predominant left-footed center halves that have played this year. Uh, looking at him with, with regards to Tyrone Mings, he's in and around the same age. He's in and around the same height. He's a good uh, physical um, comparison to Tyrone Mings. Uh, tackles, blocks, and pressures, he actually comes out better than Tyrone Mings. Once again, not taking into account strength of opposition. Not saying he's a better player than Tyrone Mings. Just on a statistical basis, over 90 minutes played, he makes more tackles, he, makes more, he has more blocks, and he puts more pressures on players doesn't take into account the opposition, as I say, or the playing style of the team. But it is important, I think, to highlight those two things. From a passing point of view, he actually plays more, he attempts more passes, and he completes more passes, and he's a better pass completion rate than Tyrone Mings. But the really, really, really interesting thing here is Tyrone Mings is a predicate. Tyrone Mings, when he plays the ball, he plays more medium-length passes. And he comes in at 19.79 passes per 90, per 90 minutes. So if we're looking to get a stylistic fit, 
or system fit. If you bring in Philip Pelender there, who's more predicated to playing those 15 to 30 yard passes, you know, he plays 22 point, 22 out of those every 90 minutes. Is that a, that's a better fit for maybe coming in to be back up to Tyrone Mings or to be a replacement for Tyrone Mings should we need to have one? You know, that's an interesting thing to think of. Uh, from a heading point of view, as I mentioned, uh, Tyrone Mings makes more headers. He's tasked with doing that and he wins more percentage of his aerial duels. Um, that's where Philip Ender's numbers maybe don't tell the full story. But then again, it is important, I think, that even when we do are looking at a league of a lesser quality, you would expect him maybe to win more of those headed battles. Now, looking at Courtney Houses, they more or less the same height. The Courtney Houses is is, um, is younger though than uh, than, than Philip Lender. Uh, once again, Philip Lender, he, Philip Lender actually out, out uh, performs him in uh, in in very much so in blocking rate. Um, Courtney House doesn't get that many blocks in. Uh, they're similar in the t in tackle rate. So Courtney House makes as many tackles give or take, uh, than, um, than Philip Linder on a, on a, on a game-per-game -game basis. And Courtney Howes, it's interesting there to see, see the difference there. He's a higher pressure rate, not by much than Tyrone Mings, but it is closer to the, to the pressure rate of 8 per 90 minutes that, uh, that Philip Linder has. Um, from a passing point of view, I think we would all expect this. That, uh, Courtney Howes doesn't have uh, a lot of passes attempted. Therefore, he doesn't have a lot of passes completed. His pass, com pass completion rate, as we see there, is similar to Tyrone Mings, but once again falls short of the higher pass completion rate that Philip Lender was. And this is probably the kicker for Courtney House. We all know how much I love Courtney House, and I think he's a very, very good defender. He's a very solid backup to have on this team. But Courtney House plays more long balls over 90, 90 minutes than any other type of, of pass. And I think that's fair to say we see it on the tape as well. So if you were to kind of come in and look for somebody who's more probably like Tyron Mings to come in and to fit that mold, should Tyron Mings get injured or should we want to maybe play a different system? I don't know. I don't know. Um Having somebody that's more comfortable playing that medium level pass probably puts you in a better position from a stylistic and a system point of view than having somebody who's less comfortable in playing, playing uh, those passes and resorts to a long ball, which is over a 30 yard pass more often in, in, for 90 minutes than, than, um, than Lander would. So that's an interesting one. That might be uh, a fit uh, for, for within the scheme and within the system. And as we know, Courtney House is just a giant in the air. He's just fantastic in the air. And, and you can't, that's, that, it's very important. You can't just understate that, that all he does is head the ball. He heads the ball. He ends it brilliantly. And, and 6.3 aerial battles won per, per game is, is just it's up there in the stratosphere when you look at it amongst, um, amongst the, uh, I think it's in the 90, top 98 or 99 percentile uh, when you look at it uh, in relation to the other top five leagues. So if we were looking at, at an overarching piece here on Philip Lender, he does some things better than both of our left-footed center half. He does some things worse. There are a lot of correlations between, and I think that's important to kind of look at, at both of those. So overall, the verdict for me on Philip Lender is while I don't think it, while I don't think it's an absolute nailed on piece, I could be convinced to say that it is possible that we could be looking at Philip Lender. Um, his pros are that he suits the style. He's a decent system fit because of what he does in comparison to Tyrone Mings. He brings more pressures in defense and he brings um he brings that medium range passing where he's more comfortable. The cons I think for him are debatable where we need him it re it's debatable whether you know we go and we spend money on a backup left left back uh, dependent on maybe what, what Courtney House's injury is like maybe it might be a bit worse than we thought um, I don't know it, maybe they want to change that style it's just it, it is debatable I'm not saying it doesn't happen there is a question mark over it and I think there's probably a question mark over his age profile as well coming into his 28th year he's going to be 28 uh, 28 pretty soon you know in the next 40 days or so he's going to be 28 and i don't know does that fit into the in, in into the way that this team wants to build considering we've mostly got younger prospects uh to date so for me i think it's possible that we sign him i'm not quite sure that we need to sign him would i be disappointed if we did sign him i don't think i would he's 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 grand, he's fine, uh, he's not going to come in here, he's not going to blow the doors off. I don't think from what I've seen of him, I'm open to discussion, I'm open to correction. And as I say, no matter what player comes into Aston Villa Football Club, they will get 112% 
of my support. So thanks very much, everybody, for listening um, and for watching, if you're watching us on YouTube. If you're listening to us in the podcast, please subscribe to the podcast. Please leave us a rating on iTunes or Spotify, a five-star rating and maybe a written review. We'd really appreciate that. If you are watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel and give us a thumbs up. Also, if you have any comments uh, underneath uh, on videos that you wish for me to do in future, I would absolutely love to because I would love to do videos or podcasts on topics that you guys would see um, as being beneficial for you guys too. So as always, thanks everybody for everything you do for the podcast. It's, uh, it's really appreciated. And all that's left to say is up the villa.